Good afternoon. Thank you, Katie. That was really interesting. Uh, we'll definitely look, be looking at Machiavelli. Uh, so I got um, kind of shoehorned into this thing uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, a bit about me, my background is fairly wide in terms of uh, broadcasting, telecommunications, a bit of local area networking. Um, work for a lot of interesting organisations. I won't um, embarrass myself by mentioning here in this context. Uh, and yes, I'm another Red Hat refugee. There's quite a few as, of us around the open source community. Uh, a little while after I left um, Red Hat, I got involved in building a solar energy monitoring and managing s management system. Um, a lot of my background is in telemetry and embedded systems, so it kind of fitted. Uh, so when I came across to NextDC, a data centre company, we're a small, brizzy-based uh, mob, Australian-owned, um, they thought it was a good idea if I got involved in figuring out how we manage the data centres, how we collect power data, display it to customers, etc. And that started a long, torturous path the challenge is that data centres are really one of the last bastions of really ugly proprietary software. And most of the proprietary software packages that we run are running on unsupported operating systems like uh, Windows 98, uh, Windows ME, if anybody is, is a few groans, can't, yeah, I couldn't, a lot of our IT guys didn't even recognise it. Um, Windows 2000 is popular. Some of it got upgraded to Windows XP recently. <laughs> you see the problem, right? <laughs> so uh, the control and telemetry systems, and this is similar to the SCADA market, they, um, the very old, the very slow moving vendors. Um, yeah, it's, it is quite a challenge. Uh, to do anything in those architectures is very costly in all respects. Um, the standard stock answer for most of the vendors we're working is $20,000. That's before they've actually read the scope of what the question is. To actually get out of bed in the morning and look at modifying the system costs you literally tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, I don't think we've had a recent quote actually below $25,000, so they may have gone through a CPI increase. You then got complex architectures, and this is typical. Uh, there's a lot of old serial comms based stuff. Um, who, who remembers RS-232? Yeah. Some of that new fangled RS-485 stuff's come in. Uh, Modbus, these are all really, I'll see a lot of smiles. This is my crowd. Uh, I mean, this is stuff that uh, I thought was old when I was doing my engineering training, and it is astonishing to find it still in everyday use in building control systems, data center management systems. And um, then you've got some interesting proprietary protocols. Uh, anybody remember Token Bus? Yep, Token Bus is alive and well in some control systems. Um, our IT team love me because every time they come across something that uh, they don't understand, they shoot it through to me. It's like my inbox is the dumping ground for the two hard basket. And it's pretty um, demanding requirements. This is actually a real diagram for one of our data centres. It's um, actually uh, part of the design for the control system in M1 in Melbourne for the power monitoring. So there's, there's different circuit breakers and um, this is actually a power distribution unit. So each one of these is a circuit breaker with a current transducer, current, current transformer, a CT. So all of the power feeds go through. The, each rack in the data center is fed from two independent feeds, from two independent power subsystems. The idea being you never actually lose power to a rack. You may lose one power bar, but you'll never lose everything. So monitoring that proved to be um, Interesting. What our CTO, Paul Gamp, at the time found 
doing quite a bit of research was something called OBIX, an OASIS standard, the Open Building Information um, <coughs> Exchange. And it's actually been around since 2003 in various forms. Um, but kind of after we stumbled across it, uh, we, we got the 1.0 standard and we read through it and thought, this is a really cool approach. We really like the way it's been done. Uh, and um, somebody had already written a fairly simple C language server for it. So we, we had a template server and we contacted them and they actually responded and were quite interested in seeing some collaboration on it. So then we looked back and then like there's Cisco, Siemens, Schneider, Intel, Google, all these people suddenly came out of the middle of nowhere while we weren't looking and got involved in this project and started uh, commenting. And um, the uh, 1.0 standard was probably about that thick. The 1.1 standard was like about that thick. Uh, and now they're working on a 1.6 standard. It's progressed that far, but it's, it's really starting to get legs. Uh, the uh, obix.org website is a, there's the committee for, um, for Obix under Oasis. So we got involved in it. Uh, we derived our server from the um, code done in the CTO project around 2009. Uh, we have pretty well rewritten it. Um, there is about oh, probably less than 200 lines out of about 30,000 lines that we haven't touched. Um, it was well licensed, it's GPL3. Uh, we've uh, re-released it in collaboration with the original author on GitHub. It codes up there. We've got a community page on the 1DC website and the community is um, there's quite a bunch of people uh, getting involved now. It's quite nice to see. So we're actually starting to eat our own dog food. We're deploying it now across three of our data centers. We're gradually migrating all of our services across to it. It's pretty cool and responsive. It's XML web services. Um, it really is de designed around instrumentation and the internet of things. So it's designed originally for buildings, but now that uh, CAS 1000 seem to have gotten involved in it, the actual scope is basically anything that you can connect to the internet and manage over an internet connection. And once you do things like Modbus to Ethernet gateways, Modbus to TCP IP gateways, then that expands it quite a bit. Perfect for us. It has really made a big impact on the real-time acquisition of data. This is a sample XML contract. It is a, um, a real one. It's actually published in our tech uh, deep dive, uh, written by our, our programmer, one of our programmers, Harry Chow. Uh, it's on our blog, and um, so you can see it's all uh, based around contracts. It's all fairly simple. One of the things that I really like about it is it's all human readable too. Uh, so if you're trying to test if something works, as long as you've got curl, you're in business. You can go and get meaningful data. And it makes it very simple to deploy things like uh, we put together a simple uh, iPhone app. Um, we've got a couple of iPhone apps out there, but uh, we've got a uh, Obix-based iPhone app that took our programmer a day and a half to put together. So templating that was really quick. This is, um, this is actually looking at, uh, again, the data center. It's M1 in Melbourne, Data Hall 4, you can see at the top. Uh, this is actually Area 4A. Um, and Verus is a type of current monitoring, power monitoring system. So we use quite a lot of Verus gear in our um, power monitoring. It shows you all of the uh, firmware details, serial numbers, all that kind of stuff, and the voltages. It pulls right down to the meter. You can look at the actual power readings, the power factor, and you can get all this in real time. So um, a good example, 
is uh, one of our technicians goes and sets something up, customer goes and puts something in their rack and they want to see how balanced their power is, uh, they can, within a matter of seconds, see exactly what power they're pulling into that rack. You can sit back in your office and you can phone the guy that's putting the gear into your rack and say, you who boofhead, you've plugged both of the power feeds into power rail A. How about you put one of the power feeds into power rail B? That's actually a fairly common scenario, actually, sadly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the implementation, one of the things that we did when we um, put the implementation together was we were very conscious that uh, quite a lot of customers want to collect data from not only the stuff that's in our data centres, but stuff they have in their other data centres. So whatever we did had to be fairly easily deployable to other infrastructures that may even not be a data centre, may be part of a building, maybe a wiring closet under the stairs someplace with a bit of air conditioning. So the flexibility and the being able to put servers into different facilities. Um, some servers may be serving multiple clients, so this shows the separation of multiple clients. Uh, the key piece to getting all this to work is a sync adapter, and this is part of the standard as well. So a sync adapter is an entity that goes on a schedule, normally around 60 seconds, in the build that we've got at the moment, and it works out what data needs to be shared to which other OBIC server. So it basically shuffles the data around. You know, the data is actually, by the way, stored in a big XML DOM tree. And that works for us at the moment. It's uh, very, very fast. Um, we're not storing anything in a database at this point. It's all in a file structure under a DOM tree. But this means that we can also set up customer exclusive servers with views across multiple facilities and we can be assured because they're running as a physically separate server or a separate VM, that security is assured. We've separated the data. Um, the other part of it is access control. One of the things that we kind of pioneered in the Australian market was electrically opened uh, access to racks. So it may not sound like a, a big thing, but people keep raving on about it like it's the second coming. It's the ability to send a contractor up to a rack in the middle of the night and not give them a key. You sit at home and when they're in front of the rack, they call you on the phone. You can unlock the rack remotely. You can monitor the fact that they went in, how long they spent in, and when they closed the rack back up. Fairly simple thing, but it's fairly useful for uh, access control for a lot of organisations and you get a complete log of, of who went where. So taking that and putting that also into OBIX um, means that we can uh, control that in a very scalable manner. One of the issues that we have with some large customers, once you get past a uh, hundred or so doors, there's a certain time in legacy architectures to actually do that physical door unlocking. If you can actually delegate that task down to an OBIC server that's sitting right close to the data center services, like the racks, um, it gets very, very responsive. So testing that we've done, we can see racks uh, in the hundreds unlock in sub-second time, which is just awesome. Uh, it's great to see. Um, the other thing that uh, we have um, as part of the standard, and again, this is something that comes from the OASIS committee, is a watchdog or a watch process. And watch processes are very flexible. You can tell it what you want to look at, whether you want to look at power, whether you want to look at the lack of power, whether you want to look at some other parameter, and anything in the OBIX environment can be tri triggering a watch process, then you set up what activity you want that watch process to do. So in this case, this is around door locking, access control, so somebody swipes an identity card on a reader in the data center. You can have a watch process on the 
controller for that that then triggers a set of actions like unlocking doors or opening a cage or something like that in a very short order. Temperature. You can have watch set up on a temperature. So if you see temperature suddenly rise, it goes past a certain threshold, it triggers a set of alarms. It could trigger a uh, emergency mode for the, um, for the crack units, the uh, air conditioning units. So there's a whole decision tree that you can build behind that. And real-time monitoring. Uh, this is where graphing and visualization become pretty important. Because we get the data so, so quick, so in such a real-time manner, and other systems like BMS systems, if you get real-time data in under 15 minutes, then it's a miracle. That their idea of real time is typically within an hour. Um, I'm not kidding. And we've had some interesting discussions with vendors about what the definition of real time should be. With the, um, and that's pretty useless for us in most cases because you, you do something, you want to see a reaction. You know, uh, Richard was saying this morning, you put a piece of toast into the toaster and you press the button. You want to see some outcome. You want to see what effect that's having on your power consumption. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is actually a uh, mock-up from um, uh, the software that we're uh, just starting to deploy now. I'm powering ahead. <laughs> so um, for more information, the OBIX committee at obix.org. Uh, the standard, you, it's... I'm not sure where the committee's got to at the moment. Um, it is a very active committee, and OASIS is very active. If you seriously are low on email subscribing to the o OASIS feeds, we'll solve that problem, I guarantee you. If you really want to get, um, get serious spam, join a committee. It's, um, it will keep, it keep your uh, free time sorted out. Uh, we actually are running a community on the 1DC website. And um, uh, if you want to have a look at the code, it's all in C. Uh, it is tiny. It runs like a scalded cat. It is so small that we've been running it on Raspberry Pis. Um, we've actually also been running on Nux, like uh, you are, Richard. So um, we, took, um, we took a bunch of Raspberry Pis to Melbourne and we used, set up a demo and uh, we um, we found that actually worked quite nicely, but uh, moving up to an Atom processor and giving it a little bit more grunt did uh, have quite an impact on it. Um, yeah, so hope that was a bit of information that um, gives you a few ideas. There's there's a lot of other projects that uh, that we're using. Uh, we're um, We've found the open source projects like for the deployment, all the deployment work we've done and all the templates you'll find are all Ansible. Um, we're, uh, uh, well, anyway, any questions? I know there's a lot of information dumped pretty quick. And I know it's a dark room after lunch. Yes. Is, um, what sort of <coughs> endpoints do you guys use for your RS-485 and RS-232 communication to actually get into a form that your OBIC servers can read? Oh, brother. We have used pretty well everything. Uh, right now we're finding that the two that um, are most reliable are Moxa gateways, uh, and we've got, um, got a couple of uh, Modbus TCP IP implementations on some devices from OpenGear, uh, another Brisbane-based company. I'm from OpenGear, so I was kind of... Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Big fan of the SD4001. <laughs> Any other questions? Wow. All right. <laughs> well... <laughs> Thank you. It's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, it's, um, and it's so much easier to configure, so much easier to deploy, and so much more reliable than 
Oh, well, let's face it, it's not running on Windows, it's all running on Linux. Uh, so it goes without saying. But uh, Richard. How big a community is this building around it? Is it getting a lot of traction with other companies? There's a lot of people who are watching uh, and some fairly impressive names, particularly uh, we've noticed most of the proprietary software vendors have signed up. Um, and that's no surprise because you know, we've spoken to some of them and pretty well to a man they are not great fans of their own software. Um, and you know, they've got to look at it from their point of view, the maintenance overhead on that stuff. Um, I you know, mentioned one in spe specifically has recently upgraded from Windows 98 to Windows XP. Just in time for Microsoft to end of life it, right? I so. Was when you said millennial. Oh, wasn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was notoriously unstable. Yeah, it is. It still is. <laughs> <laughs> um, got a little trick for you on that. Um, Take the uh, take the 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 ME build, virtualize it, put it into a VM on a Linux server, and set it up to reboot nightly. If it doesn't reboot, have a task running and get KVM to just go and flick the big red power switch off and on. <laughs> That's that is literally how we solve that problem. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Linux is the watchdog timer. Thank you very much. <laughs>